Uh, so good morning. I'm Paul Gustafson, uh, one of the third-year residents. Uh, I'll be discussing the adrenal incidentaloma as a clinical pathological correlation rounds. Uh, we're fortunate to be joined by uh, Dr. Zerowicz from radiology, as well as Dr. Dahl from endocrinology and Dr. Jones from pathology. Uh, the plan will be to briefly discuss the incidence and epidemiology of adrenal incidentaloma, then present our case. Uh, Dr. Zerowicz then uh, discuss the imaging for the case, as well as the role of uh, imaging in the adrenal incidentaloma. We'll then turn things over to uh, Dr. Dahl from endocrinology to discuss the biochemical evaluation for this case, as well as the appropriate uh, evaluation for lesion <coughs> functionality and AI in general. Uh, finally, Dr. Jones will, uh, will review the pathology associated with this case. Uh, so the adrenal incidentaloma is a uh, serendipitously discovered adrenal lesion uh, more than a centimeter on radiologic examination done for reasons other than to investigate for primary adrenal disease. Adrenal incidentaloma is excluded in patients with known malignancy or a high suspicion of malignant processes and in clinically evident adrenal disease or overt disease originally missed due to insufficient clinical examination. Uh, numerous autopsy studies have examined the frequency of incidental adrenal nodules. Uh, in a report on 25 studies, the overall frequency of adrenal adenomas in over 87,000 autopsies was uh, 6%. Abdominal CT will demonstrate an incidental adrenal nodule in up to 5% of scans. Uh, the pre uh, prevalence of adrenal adenomas increases with increasing age. Uh, for instance, the probability of finding an unsuspected adrenal adenoma on abdominal CT in a patient between 20 and 29 years of age will be 0.2% uh, as compared with approximately 7% uh, in a patient over 70 years of age. Uh, the majority of adrenal incidentalomas are benign, non-secretory, and uh, clinically silent adenomas. Uh, looking at the numbers, over 80% of incidentalomas are benign. Uh, of those benign lesions, 60% will be adenomas, 10% uh, myolipomas, uh, with roughly 6% being adrenal cysts and ganglioneuromas, respectively. Uh, Cortisol-secreting adenoma, pheo, and uh, adrenal cortical carcinoma will be discovered about 5% of the time each, with uh, metastases and aldosteronomas being found even less frequently. Uh, patients with an incidentally discovered adrenal mass are uh, offered further workup, uh, to rule out functionality and to rule out malignancy, be it primary or metastatic disease. Uh, moving on to our case now, uh, this is a case of a 69-year-old male uh, who underwent a CT chest in the community to investigate uh, a potential uh, <coughs> interstitial lung disease for a long-standing history of dyspnea, which required uh, home oxygen. On the CT chest, a 4.7-centimeter uh, left adrenal mass was discovered incidentally. Um, Otherwise, on history, the patient did not have any symptoms suggestive of a functional adenoma or malignancy. Uh, on physical examination, he was obese, but did not, however, uh, demonstrate any Cushingoid features. Uh, his blood pressure was within uh, normal limits, and uh, on initial screening blood work, he was uh, not uh, hypokalemic. Uh, this table comes from a review in the New England Journal in 2007, and uh, nicely summarizes the typical signs and symptoms associated with functional adrenal adenomas. Uh, as well as the typical features uh, seen with adrenal cortical carcinoma and metastases in the adrenal gland. Uh, I won't list all the signs and symptoms as I believe uh, Dr. Dahl will comment on this further, uh, but in our case uh, the patient did not demonstrate any signs or symptoms suggestive of a functional or metastatic lesion. Uh, on past medical history, this man had multiple comorbidities including a requirement uh, for home oxygen for COPD, <coughs> dyslipidemia, and diabetes. Uh, he was noted to have a long-standing history of hypertension, well-controlled with a single agent of hydrochlorothiazide with no recent difficulties in controlling his blood pressure. Uh, his history of diabetes dated back 20 years, and his dyslipidemia was also long-standing. Uh, his prior surgeries included open uh, cholecystectomy and appendectomy remotely. Uh, as you can see, his medications included uh, oral hypoglycemic agents as well as insulin. Uh, his only anti-hypertensive uh, uh, as mentioned, was hydrochlorothiazide, which he'd been taking for many years, and uh, there were no recent difficulties uh, controlling that blood pressure. Uh, following the, the finding of the adrenal incidentaloma, this man went on uh, to have a dedicated CT of his adrenals, and uh, I'd like to draw your attention to the language uh, used in the CT report, which notes that the mass is amenable to uh, percutaneous biopsy. Um, there are a number of case series in the literature looking at the role of uh, percutaneous biopsy in adrenal incidentaloma. 
Uh, and one small series biopsy was non-diagnostic in 80% of cases with a 20% uh, complication <coughs> rate. And the majority of cases in all these series patients had not undergone uh, biochemical evaluation first, which poses the risk uh, of precipitating a hypertensive crisis in the uh, scenario of an undiagnosed FIO. Uh, and whether it's uh, warranted criticism or not, the issue of radiology reporting is uh, raised repeatedly in these series as a major contributing factor uh, to the inappropriate use of um, uh, percutaneous biopsy. Um, however, uh, happily in our case, not only did the biopsy provide a diagnosis, it was pheochromocytoma, but the patient did not suffer a hypertensive crisis as a result of the procedure. Um, it was at this stage uh, that a referral was made to VGH for further management. Uh, it was felt that he was not a safe candidate for surgery in the community given his comorbidities. Um, uh, once the patient was seen by urology at VGH, uh, he was referred uh, to endocrinology and uh, biochemical evaluation and uh, MIBG scan was arranged as well. Uh, I'd like to turn things over at this stage to Dr. Zerowicz uh, to discuss the uh, imaging associated with this case as well as the role of uh, imaging in uh, adrenal incidentaloma. Uh, Dr. Zerowicz. Thanks, Paul. How did you uh, get a hold of my CT or my MR there? Um, <laughs> Okay, so this is our patient. Uh, this imaging outside was done at Chilliwack, and uh, this is from December 2011. Uh, the, the, it was a pro chest CT protocol. You can appreciate here that there is a uh, large mass measuring at least 4.8 centimeters incompletely imaged in the uh, left suprarenal area. And here it is on the axial images. It's quite homogeneous, lobulated. There's a little bit of uh, sort of focal uh, possible extension into the peri adrenal fat. Uh, there's an intact fat plane between the adrenal mass or the mass and the kidney and the, uh, the mass is arising from the inferior limb of the uh, left adrenal. And notably, uh, the attenuation value is very high on this contrast enhanced scan. It's about 100, almost 120 Hounsfield units, which has implications in terms of the uh, differential diagnosis. So at this point, the differential is still quite broad. Um, <clears throat> A, uh, the, the degree of enhancement here is, is quite high for an adenoma, so it would be very unusual that this would represent an adenoma. Pheochromocytoma is certainly a consideration here with, with intensely enhancing lesions. Um, metastases is a possibility. Uh, lymphoma, the attenuation value is very, very high for lymphoma, so it would be less likely. Certainly, uh, adrenocortical carcinoma would be a consideration. However, this is a male patient, and statistically, most of those appear in, in women. So that would be a little bit lower down. Um, and then I suppose a fat, poor myelolipoma could, could produce that. So with, with the attenuation value being as high as it is, um, a vascular lesion is, is, uh, is high up on the differential. I think a, a FIO would have to be a consideration here. Uh, the patient then went on to have approximately a month later a, uh, a proper adrenal washout protocol uh, CT study, also at Chilliwack. And this consists of non-contrast imaging followed by uh, imaging one minute after uh, contrast and 15 minutes. And you can appreciate here that the lesion on non-contrast is, is quite high in attenuation. Uh, it intensely enhances and it washes out substantially. And when we do the percentage washout calculation, it's 62 percent. So uh, Generally, 60% is considered to be the 60% or more is considered to be the threshold for which we're fairly comfortable that the lesion is benign. However, the degree of enhancement in this lesion is quite high, as I've mentioned, and it's atypical for an adenoma. So, the differential here is narrowed now. Uh, lymphoma and uh, adenoma are likely uh, to drop out of the differential, and we're left with other causes of lesions, including pheo an atypical presentation of an adrenocortical carcinoma, possible metastases, although as Paul's mentioned, it's quite unusual in somebody without a history of malignancy. Uh, lymphoma would be very unlikely. So at this point, it's probably between uh, uh, a non-functioning adre uh, adrenal pheo and either uh, metastasis or uh, um, an adrenocortical carcinoma. So then, uh, as an incidental finding, uh, this patient was also shown to have a very small, approximately 1.3 centimeter diameter, partially exophytic solid mass arising off the lower pole of the right kidney, which does enhance on the uh, post-contrast imaging. Now, it's important to realize that the pre- and post-contrast imaging were not done on the same day. They were done separately. Uh, 
but this lesion demonstrates uh, no uh, intralesional fat and strong enhancement over 60 Hounsfield units, or sorry, excuse me, 50 Hounsfield units, which is very suggestive of a small RCC. The differential for that being a fat poor AML and a small oncocytoma. So I don't think that's been further characterized, but that needs to be worked up. Patient underwent a biopsy, core biopsy here in Chilliwack, apparently did fine as Paula said. And then several months later, after the biopsy diagnosis of pheochromocytoma was uh, made, uh, the patient underwent an IOTO-123 uh, uh, MIBG scan, which I reviewed with um, the nuclear medicine guys yesterday, and the mass is non-MIBG added. So <clears throat> that does not actually uh, surprise us. About 20 to 30 percent of uh, pheochromocytomas may fail to uptake MIBG. Typically, uh, those lesions often have a more aggressive pathologic uh, uh, pattern uh, and or are malignant, and they lack the intracellular pathways that can synthesize and process MIBG um, uh, metabolically. Conversely, the more aggressive chromocytomas tend to be higher activity on PET. So uh, if it lights up on MIBG, it's a pheo, and it's more likely to be benign. Um, on the other hand, if it's non-enhancing on MIBG and it lights up on PET, it's more likely to be an aggressive field if the patient has a clinical history appropriate. So that's the imaging on this patient. And as Paul has mentioned, I won't re, uh, repeat these because I wasn't sure what his slides were going to show, but um, <clears throat> it's a common problem. The majority of them are benign non-functioning adenomas and myelolipomas. Uh, clinicians frequently request that they be investigated so that uh, more aggressive lesions, including METs, FIOs, cortical carcinomas, and lymphomas, can be uh, excluded. In the absence of a history of malignancy, the majority of benign appearing uh, incident incidentally detected masses that are less than 2 to 3 cms are, are in fact uh, uh, adenomas. Uh, however, in, with the patient uh, having a prior history of malignancy, the incidence of metastatic disease becomes uh, very significant, particularly if it's a new adrenal lesion uh, that's seen in follow-up after treatment of a primary malignancy elsewhere. So the imaging parameters that we can evaluate include the size of the lesion, the CT characteristics and uh, internal architecture, pre-contrast attenuation, and how it behaves following administration of IV contrast. On MRI, we look for chemical shift imaging for signal dropout, which indicates intracellular fat the signal intensity of the lesion on T2, and how it enhances with GAD. Um, <clears throat> several years ago, there was a, a panel of uh, radiology experts that was convened by the American College of Radiology to, to try to come up with imaging algorithms, management algorithms for these patients uh, who have incidentally detected masses. And this is from a 2010 white paper uh, that uh, summarizes the flow chart for management of incidentally detected renal masses. I've sent the article to Paul, so anybody who wants to review that can, can have a look at this. Unfortunately, it's complex. It'd be nice to say that it you would know, be great if it was simple, but it isn't. Um, and we'll break this down sort of sequentially into different categories as we walk through it. But essentially, our patient here falls into the category where the lesion is greater than four centimeters. And so in the absence of a history of malignancy, this lesion, at least based on the radiologic uh, literature and what's out there in, in, um, in PubMed, would suggest that this patient probably, if they are a surgical candidate, should have this thing resected. Uh, if there was a history of cancer and the primary tumor is PET avid, then it would be very worthwhile performing a PET scan to see if this thing matches the uh, activity of the known primary malignancy. Uh, certain malignancies, obviously, lymphoma, lung cancer, uh, colorectal CA. Have, are highly pet avid and, and that could be very helpful. Um, <clears throat> or if uh, the lesion is, uh, the primary tumor is not pet avid, a biopsy would certainly be warranted or should be considered uh, to exclude metastatic disease. So that's, that's kind of our patient's category. Um, probably based on the attenuation values of the lesion after contrast, it's suspicious enough for a pheochromocytoma that I would have recommended it, it just be resected and not biopsy because of the risk that Paul's alluded to. Um, so are there any imaging features that we can use that allow us to make a confident diagnosis of a benign lesion? And in fact, <clears throat> there are. There are several. On CT, if we see fat attenuation with the lesion below negative 30, that indicates that it's a myelolipoma. There are very rare reports 
of adrenal cortical carcinomas and pheos containing macroscopic fat on imaging, but they're extremely rare. Okay, so from a practical point of view, if you see macroscopic fat, it's a myelolipoma, it's a no-touch lesion. Um, similarly, if the attenuation values pre-contrast on CT are less than or equal to 10 Hausfeld units, that is diagnostic of a lipid-rich adrenal adenoma. Okay? Um, similarly, if you see loss of signal on the chemical shift MR sequences, that also indicates the presence of intracellular lipid within the mass, that's benign. That's a lipid-rich adenoma. I'll show a couple examples of that. This is an example here, uh, ultrasound and a CT in a patient with a, uh, about a 5 or 6 centimeter adrenal myelolipoma. It's very echogenic. It looks very similar to what you would see in an uh, angiomyolipoma in the kidney. It looks like fat. Um, on CT, you can see the attenuation value is the same attenuation as subcutaneous fat elsewhere in the body. Different patients on the uh, top right, this patient had bilateral adrenal adeno uh, myelolipomas. You can see there's macroscopic fat throughout, okay, in addition to the myeloid tissue here. Um, and then another one here where the attenuation value is minus 90. So the presence of uh, macroscopic fat, as determined by region of interest, indicates that it's a myelolipoma, a benign lesion. Um, <clears throat> so the, the, uh, the literature says that... Um, uh, the, the lower your threshold is in terms of attenuation value, the better your specificity. If you use a uh, near fluid attenuation uh, uh, cutoff value of 2, your specificity is very high for lipid-rich adenomas, but unfortunately the sensitivity is poor. So the standard of practice in the radiology literature is we accept less than or equal to 10 Hounsfield units as a threshold on a non-contrast scan. So the lesion is homogeneous and lower than 10, then we can confidently diagnose uh, the presence of a lipid-rich adenoma with a very high specificity. Note that it's not 100%. There are occasional uh, malignancies that can do this, but it's very, very uncommon. Um, just an example here of uh, such a case. Here's a homogeneous, less than 2 centimeter diameter, low attenuation, uh, left adrenal mass on non-con. It was 8 Hounsfield units. Another one here, slightly heterogeneous, uh, but the region of interest overall in the lesion is, is negative, so that's very, very predictive of a lipid-rich adenoma. Um, what about MRI? <clears throat> well, we'd like to use MR more frequently. Unfortunately, it's just an access issue in terms of the number of slots we have for abdomen and the scanners, but uh, particularly in young females where you're conscious about radiation dose, um, MR is the way to go. So the, uh, the principle of MR imaging involves using uh, the differential uh, rates at which um, <clears throat> fat and water uh, protons uh, precess to uh, image, sequentially image the, um, the adrenal uh, when the fat and water are in phase and then again when they are out of phase. So when the fat and water protons are in phase, the lesion, unfortunately this is a white background, it doesn't project terribly well, but the, the uh, lesion has uh, relative hyperintensity related to muscle, okay, because the fat and water signal uh, protons are in alignment and positively reinforce each other. Whereas in the out-of-phase sequences, uh, the, uh, the TE is chosen so that fat and water are completely 180 degrees out of phase and there's phase cancellation. So if there's intracellular lipid within the lesion, there will be phase cancellation on chemical shift. And so the signal intensity will drop, the lesion will turn black. And that is diagnostic of the presence of intracellular fat. It's got a very high sensitivity and specificity. Just some examples there, courtesy of Dr. Chang. So let's move over to situations where <clears throat> we can't make a confident diagnosis on the non-contrast CT. So there's a number of options that we have. Uh, if, um, if, the lesion has, uh, if the lesion is an incidental lesion and there's prior imaging follow-up, and the lesion is uh, stable over 12 months and has benign appearances and benign features included. It's very homogeneous, low density, smooth margins, no evidence of necrosis or local invasion. Then it's reasonable to consider a follow-up CT or MR in a year. If the previous imaging is not available or if the lesion has concerning findings, then we typically will progress to what's called an adrenal washout CT study. We'll just talk about that now uh, in a second. If the lesion shows absolutely no enhancement in its low density, it's consistent with either cyst or hemorrhage. Um, it can be followed up. Again, hemorrhage is seen in a 
constellation of clinical sim uh, scenarios, and so you have to match the clinical scenario to make sure that the imaging is, is concordant with the clinical status of the patient. If the lesion has absolute washout greater than 60%, uh, you can make a diagnosis of adenoma, bearing in mind some caveats, which we'll discuss. If the uh, absolute percentage washout is less than 60%, then you should consider uh, a biopsy in that setting because of the risk potentially of uh, malignancy. So the characterization of uh, incidentally detected masses with adrenal washout consists of a non-contrast uh, study and then re-imaging at 1 minute and 15 minutes after a bolus of IV contrast, which is what was done at Chilliwack. The absolute percentage washout is uh, calculated when you have all three of these phases, and that's what we do at VGH. Generally, uh, an absolute percentage washout greater than 60% uh, confirms the presence of an adrenal adenoma with a high degree of sensitivity and acceptable specificity. However, there are some caveats to that. Absolute percentage washout calculations are only appropriate when the mass is under 4 centimeters. That's what the literature, uh, the cutoff for size in most studies was 4 cm's. Um, it's, it's most valuable when the mass is very homogeneous. If the mass is very heterogeneous or necrotic, it, it can, that, the, the low density areas that don't enhance after contrast can spuriously change the washout calculation and potentially render it invalid. And then finally and most importantly, and it's particularly uh, pertinent in this case, if the lesion demonstrates intense enhancement at one minute, regardless of how it washes out, you have to consider the possibility of a theochromocytoma. Okay, and I'm not sure that they considered that possibility here. I haven't seen the final report, but I, I'm not sure specifically how it was worded, but, but that is a very strong concern in this patient. So uh, there's studies that indicate that uh, adenomas and pheochromocytomas behave very differently in terms of the intensity of their enhancement at one minute. Um, pheos generally are much more uh, contrast avid and intensely enhancing than adenomas. This is uh, an example of a lipid poor adrenal adenoma. So on non-contrast, the threshold uh, attenuation is 19 here. It's above the limit of 10, so we cannot call this a lipid-rich adenoma, but it demonstrates modest enhancement and a high degree of enhancement. The enhancement is, or sorry, high degree of washout, excuse me, and the enhancement is very homogeneous and it lacks any concerning features like central necrosis or local invasion. So we can be very confident in this setting that this is a lipid, poor adrenal adenoma. And this, going back to the patient that Paul is presenting, here's the, uh, here's the imaging here, just to revisit it. So baseline attenuation, well above 10. Degree of enhancement, greater or, or at the 100 threshold, so it's highly concerning for a feel. And then the washout is over 60, but as we've mentioned, in the presence of intense enhancement at one minute, the washout calculation does not uh, exclude the presence of a pheo. So pheo is still in the differential here. Um, examples of adrenal malignancies, just to wrap it up, um, most of these uh, primary adrenal cortical, cortical carcinomas are, are diagnosed when they're large. They're very heterogeneous. They may be locally invasive. This is not the typical appearance whatsoever of of, a, uh, of an adenoma, but it would certainly fit for a non-functioning pheo. Uh, similarly, metastatic disease, there's a primary cancer in the lung. Lung loves to go to adrenal. Uh, back in the 90s, there were studies that were performed uh, of biopsy of the adrenal glands in patients with uh, <coughs> um, <coughs> clinically limited non-small cell lung cancer, and it found that 14% of patients actually had microscopic adrenal metastases even though the adrenals morphologically look normal on CT. So, you know, to illustrate aggressive features, ill-defined margins, central necrosis, bilaterality, um, infiltration of adjacent structures, periadrenal fat, the, uh, so, uh, the crust of the diaphragm here, those are all highly concerning features for malignancy. And then finally, just to touch on, on uh, MRI and FIOs, uh, MR is particularly helpful in field chromocytoma because there are some, some unique features that you can see in the majority of patients. Uh, often when the fields are small, they're homogeneous and intensely enhancing, but as they get larger, there's a tendency for them to undergo cystic degeneration, which is what we're seeing here on the uh, T2-weighted sequence. You can see these high signal int intensity areas here, uh, not quite as high as CSF, but uh, reasonably high indicating cystic change. And then the key thing that we look for, it's unfortunate there's a white background here, but um, the key thing we look for is intense enhancement, and it's often heterogeneous. Uh, 
in the solid elements of the tumor. Obviously, the cystic areas will not enhance. Um, and then the other sign that's very helpful on T2-weighted sequences is the presence of what's called a light bulb sign. About two-thirds of, of adrenal uh, pheochromocytomas will have very high signal intensity on the T2-weighted images, which becomes even more dramatic when you do fat sat. Uh, and then in the same patient here, you can appreciate that there's intense areas of heterogeneous enhancement following administration of GAD. So that's, that's the classic appearance of, of a feel. So the key points from imaging are, first of all, the incidental mass is a very common uh, finding. Size is not a reliable indicator of malignancy. However, if the patient has uh, no prior history of malignancy and it's a small lesion with benign appearances, the vast majority of those are going to be adenomas. Uh, always consider metastatic disease if the patient has a new adrenal mass and uh, prior history of malignancy. And uh, the presence of bilateral lesions favors metastatic disease, lymphoma, and hemorrhage. And then finally, we can make a confident diagnosis of a benign lesion if we see attenuation values less than 10 Hounsfield units or signal loss on chemical shift imaging, in which case it's a lipid-rich adenoma. If uh, it's less than minus 30 household units, that's macroscopic fat. That's a myelolipoma with very rare exception. Um, and then always consider uh, the diagnosis of pheochromocytoma if the attenuation value rises to more than 100 household units on the portal venous phase or if it has high signal intensity on T2 in association with very strong enhancement. So thank you very much, and I'll hand it back over to Paul. Great. Thanks, Dr. Jones. That was great. Yeah. Yeah. What in the particular context for the uh, contrast contraindicator? I, mean, I assume they got away with this. Well, you do, you do, well, you do GAD. You, you use MRI in that setting. Yeah, for sure. There's no risk for being uh, Well, you have, yeah, I mean, if their GFR is impaired less than 30 or 40, you'd want to probably want to optimize that. So, Chuck, in this case, do you think an MRI would have been your next choice instead of the MIT? Well, I, personally, I would have said, you know, looking at the CT, I would have said, it's, there's no way this is an adrenal adenoma. It's probably a non-functioning feel uh, or ACC that probably should come out. Because, I mean, the bottom line is, if you biopsy this lesion and it's a pheo, and you get a negative result, is it going to change your management? The answer is no. It's coming out, unless the guy's a train wreck for surgery, in which case you want a tissue diagnosis. And if you even think of the diagnosis of PO, uh, you have to take a lot of precautions before you biopsy the patient. Right? If you need anesthesia standby, you need the alpha block, beta block, the whole works. Is there any reason to check why the rate of indeterminate biopsy of adrenal is always said to be so high? It seems to me that it should be any more difficult than a legal mass, for example, with the biopsy more frequently. Yeah, I don't I don't know the answer to that, Peter. It seems like old, Maybe old Ed, dogma. Ed, what can you is that here? Yeah, sorry, can you comment on that? Like, what, is there, do you seem to feel that there's a high negative or indeterminate biopsy rate for adrenal lesions here? For adrenal? Yeah. And we don't see very many of them. We don't see very many adrenal biopsies, and it's usually in the context of a normal malignancy and mm -hmm. suspicion for metastases. Because uh, we're always talking about adrenal. Yeah, yeah. Except uh, in the uh, not a case, it's key in life. The sarcoma team yeah. recommends every suspicious adrenal lesion you want to just do a little sarcoma. And is the, was the MIDG scan done to rule out metastases or to further assess the problem? Uh, both. Um, just going to move on to Dr. Dahl now just before we run out of time. Um, our patient uh, went on to have a 24-hour urine test. Uh, I apologize that the results uh, don't project well, but this shows that the 24-hour uh, urine catecholamines, metanephrines, and uh, VMA were elevated. Um, I'd like to turn things over to uh, Dr. Dahl now uh, to discuss these results uh, further, uh, as well as the appropriate hormonal evaluation for the incidentaloma. Thanks, Dr. Dahl. Yeah, thanks. For thanks. Coming. Yeah. Space bar. Well, that's great. Thanks. I mean, you, I think my role is pretty peripheral here. Usually for endocrinology, you're getting sent something for diagnosis. And here the system was kind enough to provide a biopsy diagnosis at referral of pheochromocytoma. So I thought, yeah, thank you very much. That's, that's what it is. Um, you know, there are a lot of adrenal incidentalomas around. And I guess if you looked at the referral patterns from the community, the sequence is imaging adrenal incidentaloma and then um, endocrinologist or urologist or general surgeon with an interest in the area. I, I think the majority of people that I'd be sent are coming with low-density, clear lipid-rich adenomas where there's a question about functional status. 
No, I don't know if that's the same pattern that you're seeing as urologist, or there's selection bias because of that, because if the, I suppose if it's a larger lesion or they're more suspicious, they're more likely to make a surgical referral. But sometimes I think people, I, I don't know, it's hard to tell. Um, the um, alternate title of uh, this is what could possibly go wrong? What's wrong with picking up the biopsy needle? Uh, it's along with other good ideas for a suspected field chromocytoma. Um, so we've talked a little bit about the definition, which was the mass lesion. You'll notice a lot of Paul's references came from uh, William Young, who's of the Mayo uh, Group Rochester, who's had a great interest in adrenal incidentalomas and speaks frequently about their, their assessment. And again, we've talked a little bit about the uh, general uh, prevalence, which is why I think we're all seeing this, and the differential diagnosis, the vast majority of which are, are simple adenomas and may not need uh, other issues. So the really questions the questions are, is there malignancy, which is based on combination of assessment of the size, and importantly, the imaging phenotype just discussed, and usually where I come in is, is on the functional status, history, physical, and hormonal assessment. Um, with respect to the cancer risk, um, size is not a determining factor, but uh, they, if they tend to be more indolent, then they're just more likely to be large by the time they're picked up. And then just breaking down a few of the classic symptoms, I'd say the thing most concerned about would be either Cushing syndrome or subclinical Cushing syndrome. And there's a real spectrum clinically from um, almost asymptomatic, really? They've got Cushing syndrome? They don't look like it, to the total classic phenotype with which we're all familiar. Um, hypertension, osteoporosis, diabetes, dyslipidemia. Um, the literature suggests the best uh, screening test for an adrenal adenoma for uh, Cushing syndrome is the overnight one milligram dexamethasone suppression test. It has a higher sensitivity and specificity than 24-hour urine cortisols. Um, a uh, AM cortisol after that below 130 um, is uh, very reassuring. False positives are, co are possible still though with people with sleep disturbance, psychosis, um, and marked obesity. And there's confirmatory testing that could be done with a, a formal two-day high-dose testing protocol. <coughs> you think primary help hyperaldosteronism would be found more often, um, could present with hypertension. Lots of people with primary hyperaldosteronism do not have hypokalemia. It's not, it doesn't rule it out if you missed it. Um, you, not everybody needs screening for it. It's suggested in the hypertensive patient to, that the uh, single best test would be a um, up aldosterone renin ratio off uh, meds that interfere with your spironolactone and ACE inhibitors. And the, it's a fussy test in that it's an upright 30 minutes uh, seated test. Have to be off the confirmatory medicines and if they're, if they're on ACE inhibitors, many people are, you've got to switch for actually a couple weeks onto a calcium blocker. And I cannot give you numbers because every kit, every lab has their own um, pattern for the aldosterone renin ratios. They're wildly different numbers. Um, they're, um, they're not generalizable between the operating characteristics of the test are different. And so what you really need is the uh, laboratory chemist will make a comment about the likelihood of hyperaldosteronism for that lab based on their results, and you'll always get that comment. If it's suggestive of hyperaldosteronism, the uh, saline suppression test is the next uh, um, the, um, biochemical test and adrenal vein sampling uh, may or may not be needed after that. And of course, here we're talking about pheochromocytoma. And you can see this gentleman was, yeah. Is there not an aldosterone assay now? Yeah, so the aldosterone assay, it, what happens is it measure both the aldosterone and renin at the same time. So a high aldo, low renin state would be suggestive of primary hyperaldosteronism. But there's a fair range of where the aldosterone can be found. It depends on things like salt content and things like that. So um, the initial screen with the aldosterone-renin ratio gives you an aldosterone assay, renin assay, the relationship of the two. And um, even then, there's enough overlap to go for this suppression so testing. They had an SOP at St. Paul's for pure aldosterone without the um, Even then, St. Paul says, no, we still want the uh, RAA ratio and then suppression testing. Uh, this gentleman uh, appeared to be pretty asymptomatic. Um, and there's, so there's this whole range from people who say, really, he's got a feel, to, my, my goodness, he must have a feel based on a number of, of classic symptoms, which we'll talk about in a bit. Um, it's suggested that the 24-hour urine metanephrines are probably the best screen, but there are a number of false positive drugs because that affect um, catecholamine metabolism, uh, particularly the uh, tricyclics. See that a fair bit, where you have normal metabolites elevated, normal other metabolites, and lesser effect with some of the other medications. And um, adrenocortical carcinoma, at least, um, it's possible to have a malignant Cushing syndrome. Um, I 
it's pretty rare to have either androgen or estrogen secreting tumors, and there are uh, malignant con syndrome tumors. So the biochemical workup is fairly similar to what we've um, talked about here. It's uh, or the whole workup. It's a biochemical workup with uh, hormone testing first, um, some suggestion of one of the three etiologies, then head on to confirmatory testing, which is down the right side of the chart here. Um, and then, so essentially, with us, you might have a small benign um, adenoma that's uh, secretory, and, and that's an indication for surgery. Um, negative results in biochemical testing, uh, more questions about the imaging phenotype. We don't have it already, and we've already gone through the issues for benign and suspicious appearances. Um, so really, for a non-secretory benign adenoma, we're down to the middle box at the bottom with uh, consideration of repeat imaging um, at six-month <coughs> intervals, hormone testing annually for a year surgery if the mass is uh, growing. And of course, for a suspicious um, appearance in a non-secretory lesion, that's um, particularly if there's metastatic disease, that might be either biopsy or more likely for surgery, depending on this. So I was just kind of curious to know um, a little bit more about the literature series about, about what happens when fields are biopsied. And Young and the Mayo Clinic had done a paper on that in surgery. You can see that their bias is um, probably not to do that, um, based on the title. And so this was a quick review. They had 20 consecutive patients. They did a retrospective record review. Uh, 14 were FEO, six were paragangliomas. All were biopsied prior to referral to the Mayo Rochester. 90% um, of them had had no pre-biopsy biochemical testing, and the remaining 10% had had negative uh, testing for FEOs. About the complication rate from the biopsy, they fell to a 70%, and I'll show you what those were. Um, their patient characteristics, um, we're in mid-50s, male to female, 12 to 8, uh, 14 to 6 fields versus paragangliomas. Uh, tend to be larger tumors in the 6 centimeter range. Um, let's see, the 10 of the fields were benign, 4 malignant, 50% um, of the paragangliomas were malignant. Two had false negative metanephrines uh, prior to biopsy out of the 20. Um, 20 of them had CT, 3 had ultrasounds, 3 had MRIs. In terms of the symptoms, um, the largest presenting complaint at the bottom was abdominal or flank pain. Uh, there was some nausea, hypertension, palpitation, some weight loss, fatigue. The anxiety was just like two and three were asymptomatic. So there were symptoms. They're kind of nonspecific, but um, in terms of asking people um, for symptoms that might suggest pheochromocytoma, that was their, their finding in this series with this selection thing. Um, the pathologic diagnosis was FEO in 8, paraganglioma in 4, inadequate in 2, low-grade neoplasm in 1, and a number of other atypical cells and lymphomas and things like that. <laughs> and really what their biopsy complications were um, hematoma in 6 out of 20, and they say that's not, not trivial because it does affect the um, surgical management. Uh, it hurt. Uh, there was three hypertensive cages, three delays to surgery, one error in diagnosis. Um, what they term difficult surgical resection, which really often related to hemorrhage in the mass. Uh, one person needing conversion to open adrenalectomy, and they felt this was sort of in 70%. They said that their, um, this re their bias when they looked at this was that uh, rarely, that really biopsy of the mass does not really change one's surgical management based on the presentation before, the imaging phenotype, the biochemical studies, if you have them that they received the same surgical management that they would have if they didn't. And they felt that this reinforced that their, their bias, that really there was no change in management to, um, in, in these cases, for having done biopsy. So in this case, you know, we know adrenal incidentals are common. The phenotype is extremely helpful to me, certainly when I get referred somebody for the malignancy potential. Um, it, it's really very simple testing, 24-hour metanephrines for the catecholamine status, Overnight one milligram dex suppression test for the cortisol status. Not everyone needs uh, aldos morning aldosterone renin ratio. It's really for the hypertensive patients. So in a low risk lesion with no hypertension, that's usually, that's the one biochemical test that's usually uh, left out. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Dalton, yeah. can you maybe just say a word or two about your sort of involvement in the perioperative care. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. So uh, there's a question then uh, about what to do with respect to um, biochemical management. You know, the, the older ma way of managing folks with the uh, fairly heavy alpha blockade, you know, order of phenoxybenzamine from uh, Ottawa Health Protection Branch, we've done, done that, uh, really load on the alpha blockade, see the blood pressures come down, they've got a stuffy nose, they're getting orthostatic hypertension, add some beta blockade after alpha. Um, 
then they'd go for surgery, um, press on the adrenal, get more, more stuff out, pull the adrenal out, they'd have like hypotension, take tons of fluid, operating room things. And so over the years, um, particularly Cleveland Clinic sort of has moved to an idea of using a much less intense alpha and uh, then also beta blockade regimen preoperatively to try to sort of avoid over blocking and, and uh, the sort of um, hypovolemia that often accompanies this. And so um, the tendency now in the endocrine society guidelines are to use an a lighter alpha blockade. Um, um, alpha, regular alpha blockers are used and this, and this gentleman Look, it's a fairly indolent tumor. He may have a lot of catecholamines in the urine, but he's been biopsied, he's been pushed and prodded, and he went to, he went to, in terms of pre-op management with a mixed alpha-beta blockade of uh, labetalol and did fairly well. The most important thing is really about the, at a, at a center like this, to come to this kind of center and have anesthesia who are used to, you know, doing cardiac surgery, doing minute-by-minute um, -minute blood pressure management with the nitroposide writing, writing here and you know, nitroglycerin here and to be able to dial things up and down. And, and that leads to a much lower rate of immediate post-op, uh, both volume and blood pressure shifts. So the tendency now is to use uh, basically a lighter alpha blockade than to add some beta blockade, not, not be as intense as previous, and, and leave most of the management really to the anesthetist at the time. Great, thanks. Great, thanks. Can I ask a question? Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm just curious what your experience is with the main sampling for cons. Like, do you do it ever? So there, yeah, questions about how about adrenal vein sampling for Kahn syndrome. So first, biochemical diagnosis. Gee, he's got to suggest, this person has a suggestive aldosterone renin ratio. Saline suppression test um, fails to suppress. Um, so Young's approach on this is you have a, if you have a clear-cut hyperaldosteronism and really a, a clear-cut um, single adenoma, you know, nothing visible in either adrenal glands, it's really there. Um, he also risk stratifies according to age and gender, so younger man or woman with really no other risk factors for anything. Um, in that case, they don't suggest proceeding to adrenal vein sampling. It's like, that's such a clear adenoma, this is the diagnosis that's coming out. In conditions where, in, where it's less clear, you know, the adrenal glands are kind of nodular, older person, other things going on, um, then they suggest um, uh, stimulated adrenal vein sampling to uh, look at that, and that's uh, done with uh, both um, ACTH. So you can so that you measure the cortisol from the vein and the aldosterone, so you get a gradient versus circulation. So the real technical issue is success in cannulating the right adrenal uh, vein, which is very can be very difficult. And so that's very most of the studies I've seen, including uh, some Mayo series, just talk about how operator dependent that is. And so I I guess I'd be in the the bias of the biochemist at St. Paul's with the most interest in this is he has, because often he's the person who sees these aldosterone renin ratios, recommends stuff, and his, his bias has been sending people to a Royal Columbian for sampling, feeling that it's there. And I don't have any particular comments, yes or, or no, about that. I think um, I'd, like to, I'd like to know what the operator characteristics are among the, the various radiologists here, who are doing so them. Um, so is it ordered? It's certainly ordered. Um, I, I don't think there's... You know, I think there might be a dozen a year. I'm going to guess. I, I might be off on that, but I don't. I don't find you have to order them too much. A lot of times, the case is fairly clear. Thank you, Dr. Bell. That's great. Thank you. Right, so, uh, just getting back to the case uh, quickly now. Uh, after a review by Dr. Dahl and being seen in the uh, pre-anesthesia assessment clinic, uh, he was started on uh, mixed alpha and uh, beta blockade with labetalol. Uh, uh, as Dr. Dahl commented, uh, the fewer did not seem very active uh, with no obvious symptoms, no discernible effect on his blood pressure, and no reaction to the biopsy. Uh, he went to the operating room with the intention of undergoing a laparoscopic adrenalectomy, but at the time of surgery, the mass uh, appeared invasive, invasive into the upper pole of the kidney, and uh, there were some issues uh, with bleeding as well, and it was felt that it was safest just to pursue uh, nephrectomy and adrenalectomy um, on block. It was carried out laparoscopically without complication. Uh, uh, intraoperatively, there were no concerns about hypertensive crises, uh, uh, patient did well, and uh, postoperative course was also unremarkable, and uh, this man as well at uh, last follow-up, uh, five months post-op. Uh, I'll give the floor to Dr. Jones now to uh, discuss uh, pathology. Thanks. How do I advance this? <laughs> <laughs> 
this one? Just that down arrow there. That's right. Okay. Good. Um, <clears throat> it's, it's not often that we receive a biopsy of uh, uh, the adrenal gland. Uh, I do have the slides, and they show pretty much uh, what we see uh, that I'll be showing you uh, from the main resection specimen. Um, uh, the uh, reported uh, success rate with a biopsy of an incident loma in the adrenal gland uh, is uh, low. Uh, that is, there is a high false negative rate, and the, and the uh, negative um, predictive value is, is, uh, is, is, um, is quite low. Um, in the, uh, if there's an obvious mass, and in the context of a known uh, uh, malignancy with suspicion of uh, metastases, the, the uh, rate of success is much higher, around 70%, as has been stated. Uh, or if there's an obvious mass of a retroperitoneal mass of sarcoma, um, uh, that can be helpful as well. Uh, we will not be able to tell you easily, uh, having successfully biopsied a mass in the adrenal gland, whether it's benign or malignant, if it's, an, if it's a cortical or medullary uh, tumor. Uh, certainly the biopsy in this case was uh, diagnostic. <clears throat> now this, uh, the, the slides that I have uh, for you are from the uh, main resection uh, specimen, that is the adrenalectomy and nephrectomy. Uh, and, and this is the adrenal gland, uh, which uh, uh, the tumor did uh, merge with, uh, showing you the uh, adrenal cortex with adrenal capsule, a little bit of fat, and uh, medullary tissue in your far left uh, corner of the of the slide. And you, you can appreciate that the uh, cortical tissue with its um, uh, zone of fasciculata being most prominent uh, uh, is lipid laden with uh, cleared uh, vacuolated uh, cytoplasm. And the uh, medullary uh, uh, tissue uh, is uh, uh, darker staining with uh, granular amphipilic uh, cytoplasm that you can appreciate at this uh, power uh, and at higher power that can be even better appreciated uh, with the adrenal cortical uh, cells on your uh, left and the uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, medullary uh, uh, tissue in your upper uh, right uh, half of the screen. And, and usually on a biopsy we can uh, differentiate between the uh, uh, two uh, compartments um, although there are instances uh, where uh, that can be difficult, for example, um, adrenal cortical uh, adenomas may be pigmented for, and, and have darker cytoplasm and, and have disorganized pattern that somewhat simulates uh, a pheochromocytoma, but typically it's not a problem. And a classic uh, pheochromocytoma is uh, uh, readily diagnosable on uh, histology as seen in this uh, photomicrograph where we have a, a, a typical uh, 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 Zellbollen uh, pattern with uh, groups of cells uh, finely divided by a, 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 a fine uh, a vascular network uh, that in areas can become uh, congested, that some of this may be operative related, uh, and, and if this is very prominent, some people refer to an, quotes, angiomatoid pattern of pheochromocytoma. Typically, the cells are quite a bit larger than normal medullary uh, uh, cells and uh, have uh, nuclear uh, size and shape variability, at times marked uh, with uh, uh, intranuclear uh, 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 pseudo-inclusions. These are cytoplasmic intrusions into the nucleus. Uh, this degree of variability and atypicality is, is very uh, common in uh, pheochromocytoma and is really not an indication of uh, behavior. Uh, at a higher uh, magnification, we can readily appreciate the Zellbollen pattern. One may also have a trabecular pattern or more solid pattern of, of, of smaller cells, uh, and that latter finding can be a worrisome feature. But this is, this is really quite a straightforward uh, uh, appearance of a pheochromocytoma or a, a, a neuroendocrine uh, type, uh, uh, cell type. Note the uh, arcades of fine uh, vascularity uh, defining the uh, balls of... Uh, of uh, tumor cells. Uh, an S100 immunostain uh, was done in the biopsy and did not find any sustentacular cells. On the, uh, on the uh, main resection specimen, we do have uh, uh, sustentacular cells highlighted with the uh, S100 immunostain, uh, and uh, typically uh, these cells are interspersed uh, around the perimeter of the uh, groupings of uh, tumor cells. Um, uh, it is uh, often commented that uh, with reduction in number of sustentacular cells, that can be an uh, a worrisome finding in terms of uh, potential for malignant uh, behavior. And these were quite sparse in this tumor. Uh, 
the chromogranin uh, immunostain, uh, uh, a uh, marker of uh, uh, neuroendocrine differentiation, uh, uh, in this instance is, is uh, strongly positive throughout the tumor cells with uh, granular cytoplasmic staining. <clears throat> Uh, this is an area of uh, the tumor that was particularly uh, uh, hemorrhagic, um, uh, but importantly, there was no uh, necrosis. Areas of confluent uh, necrosis were not identified, and although there is considerable atypicality in some areas, and in particular this area, the very large uh, hyperchromatic cells, uh, mitotic activity was not a, uh, uh, a significant uh, feature. There are other worrisome uh, features in this case, though. Uh, it did invade through a capsular fibrous uh, boundary, as we see in this uh, low-power photomicrograph, in infiltrating into uh, 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 the uh, uh, adjacent uh, adipose uh, tissue, although it did not uh, invade the uh, kidney. The kidney was not involved by uh, the pheochromocytoma. <coughs> The synaptophysin uh, immunostain, also another uh, uh, neuroendocrine marker, uh, which in this case expectedly is uh, uh, strongly and diffusely positive. Just uh, uh, as an aside, I should point out that uh, this stain can show some positivity in adrenocortical uh, neoplasms, and, and pathologists have to be aware of that. Uh, but this pattern, uh, and, and in this context, is certainly all uh, supportive of the diagnosis of pheochromocytoma. Interestingly, it uh, shows uh, uh, a rather dispersed pattern of the tumor cells uh, filtering out uh, into the uh, fat to a somewhat greater degree than what one could easily appreciate on H&E alone. Um, and uh, uh, this tumor uh, was uh, 6.5 centimeters in size, uh, and extended uh, uh, medially somewhat, and, and the medial border there was a focal uh, uh, margin uh, positivity. Um, <coughs> So given its size and, and uh, some of these uh, uh, infiltrative uh, patterns, uh, there, there is some uh, uh, concern for a more aggressive uh, behavior in this uh, tumor. And indeed, uh, in the, uh, 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 towards the hilum of the kidney, uh, the tumor showed some uh, extension along peri uh, uh, peripheral nerve uh, tracks and microscopic foci, not gross foci, but microscopic foci of uh, a vascular invasion. Um, having said that, I'm not sure that there's anything more to be done than closely follow the uh, 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 patient. Uh, the only um, definite uh, uh, diagnostic criterion of malignancy in these tumors is the presence of metastases. Uh, All right. Uh. Thanks, everyone, uh, for coming. Thanks to Dr. Uh, Patterson, too, who helped uh, review the slides.